of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. Then he came to the second, and he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? End quote. This is the short but poignant parable of the two sons. It was delivered to the elders in the temple of Jerusalem just one day after Christ's triumphant entry on Palm Sunday. Now, our Lord was, maybe you could say, in an aggressive state of mind when he spoke these words. For in the last 24 hours, he had driven out the money changers from the temple, from his father's house, and he had cursed the fruitless fig tree when it failed to provide him anything to eat for breakfast that morning. Clearly, Christ was in no mood to offer any comforting platitudes or any easy lessons to the people who were about to conspire to persuade the believers to crucify him in just a few days' time. What he is saying here is twofold. There are those of you here in the temple who are ashamed of me and my father, and there are those of you here who lack integrity and commitment. Those who are ashamed, doubtful, or apathetic, or anxious about their faith are those like the first son who refused the father's initial call to work. Our Lord explained that these leaders and experts in the Mosaic law refused to accept John the Baptist's message of repentance and spiritual purity. They knew what God desired and were given plenty of opportunities and reminders to act accordingly, but they refused to do so time and time again. Were they unable to bear this gospel of mercy and grace because they knew it would put them on equal footing with sinners and Gentiles? Was it the fear of losing their lofty social status if they were to commit to a faith in Jesus Christ? Or was it that they just simply didn't care what God wanted them to do, and they sought instead to pursue their own selfish comforts and luxuries? Who can tell which is the reason for each of these individual people in this parable? The second group of people are even worse off. While this parable, Christ explains that the first son was able to see the error of his ways and repent in time, the second son was too self-absorbed and devoid of any accountability to notice his own failures. He was wise enough to understand what the father wanted, but inwardly he cunningly plotted his excuses and escape plans to get away from doing it. Both of these sons were emblematic of a greater flaw found in the believers in Jerusalem at the time. Whether they were the fearful, doubting, or stubborn first type, or whether they were the two-faced, undependable second sons, the same result awaited both of them. Neither would enter the kingdom of heaven without dramatically changing their ways. Today, I bring this passage to our attention because this weekend at St. Nicholas, we are celebrating faithful and unyielding service. We give honor to our brave servicemen and women who have put themselves in harm's way in order to defend our freedoms and basic human rights across the world. No matter what branch, or for how long, or in what capacity these veterans offered their service to our country, every single one of them served faithfully and eagerly when called upon. We are indebted to them for their heroism and perseverance in the face of danger and in the threat of death itself. In a few minutes here, we will invite the murderers back up and we will offer a small token of our appreciation with a brief prayer service, not only for those here in person, but also those who have fallen asleep throughout the world. May their memories be eternal. However, their service, this military service, is not the only kind of service we honor today. We also today thank and celebrate our faithful stewards of St. Nicholas. Much like our veterans, each and every one of these stewards have answered a call to preserve and protect our spiritual home front. Without an army, any kingdom is vulnerable of collapse. Likewise, without a strong company of committed stewards, our parish would surely fall. We may not brandish any weapons in our service to our parish. We may not have uniforms. We may not be given any medals to wear on our chests. But the service rendered by those 
who eagerly and faithfully give of their time, talents, and treasures to the church is as invaluable as those who patrol the front lines across the globe. But now for a moment, consider what our armed forces would look like if either of these two sons in the parable made their ranks. Half would enlist and then go AWOL at the first sign of trouble. The other half wouldn't even report for duty in the first place. What kind of country would that be if these two sons were all that made up our armed forces? I'll tell you what kind of country that would be. That would be a country that time forgot because they would have been conquered by the first nation that dared cross their borders. Now take a moment to think about our parish. Is there ever a time when we can see either of these two attitudes that these two sons had towards stewardship? Are there times when we say that we're going to give to our church, but don't? Sadly, yes. We began the year with 244 stewards. That's 244 steward households here at the church. As of October, we had 60-plus families who had pledged at the beginning of 2023 and have not yet made a single donation towards that pledge. You add in another 35 families who have pledged and have given, but have only given less than 50% of their pledge. You add those two things together, and now we're looking at more than a third of the parish who either pledged and didn't give at all, or pledged and only gave some. Now, we know that many things happen in life. Sometimes we have the best intentions, but for whatever reasons we cannot follow through on our initial plans. That's fine. We will never hold anyone in debt for failing to meet their original pledge. But we also need a level of accountability and dependability from our stewards so that we can continue offering daily ministries and services to our faithful. Thankfully, these numbers of unfulfilled pledges have been lowering steadily in the last month since our most recent statements went out. But there still is a considerable ground to make up in order to meet our year-end goals here in the last six weeks. That's the one attitude. But what about the other? Are there occasions where any of you can think of when the call to support the church was left unanswered altogether? Have any of us received a stewardship packet in the mail and simply tossed it in the trash with the Bed Bath & Beyond coupons, right? And the other junk. Have any of us heard the stewardship testimonials from one of our brothers or sisters here at St. Nicholas and thought, that's nice, good for them. I'll let someone else carry my burden for the parish. Have any of us thought, stewardship isn't something I need to do. I volunteer and I work the festival one weekend a year. The festival funds do not support our daily operations. They are strictly intended for capital expenses. We need you too. We need all of you. Like the 60 plus families who have pledged but haven't given, there is an eerily similar 68 families out there who are on our mailing lists, who come to things, who get email blasts, and who get our mailings and have not pledged in the last two years. We are a parish of 244 families, as I said earlier, not 2,044. Every household matters. Every pledge counts. For those of you uncomfortable with financial messages being delivered to you from the pulpit, toughen up, because Christ offered plenty of financial messages. He talked about rich men and eyes of needles and camels. He talked about unforgiving debtors and the importance of paying taxes. He even spent his last precious days on earth in that final week in Jerusalem talking about the widow's might and flipping over money-changing tables and this same parable that we offer today of those two unworking, uncommitted sons and servants. If you don't want your priest preaching about money to you, then repent. Change how you look at stewardship. Make a pledge in proportion to your gifts that you've been given, and then fulfill your pledge. Don't look at it as a burden. Look at it as a proud and glorious service, like our veterans do. They don't serve the country begrudgingly. They serve it cheerfully, like we heard in today's epistle. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful steward. 
This is your honor to support this church. It is an honor to give of yourself to fulfill his purposes. Today we celebrate those who have answered the call, both to bravely serve our country and to boldly serve our church. We can learn from our mistakes of these two sons in this parable, and in doing so, provide a more secure, more fruitful spiritual home for our families and for future generations to enjoy, now and forever into the ages of ages. Amen. I'd like to invite our myrrh to come up in two lines on either side of me. We're going to offer a trisayun service for our veterans, but first we're going to offer a dedication service to our first funds. Let us all rise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Heavenly Father, you have richly blessed us beyond measure. We can only return a fraction of the gifts that you have entrusted to us. But we ask, O good and loving God, that you will bless our offerings and help us to use them wisely in your service and to your glory. You sent your only begotten Son, our Lord, God, and Savior Jesus Christ to us. And as he fed the 5,000 and their families from the small gifts offered by the young child in the crowd, we pray that you will also transform the gifts here offered today. May these first fruits of our stewardship also feed the spiritually hungry through the ministry and mission of our church. All that we have received is from your hand, and to you all glory, honor, and worship are due. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Amen.